to this keynote controversy uh, panel debate, what does it mean to be a liberal today? I'm Claire Fox, I'm the director of the Institute of Ideas. I was reflecting on this and, and wondering whether calling oneself a liberal was a mixed blessing or not, because there has been times that I've called myself a liberal and been accused of being a bleeding heart or wishy-washy as a consequence, or on the other hand, of being a hard-nosed, laissez-faire capitalist. So uh, on the one hand, there's sometimes a confusion about what it means to be a liberal. Certainly, we live in a new era for liberals. There's been a lot of uh, rhetoric in the United Kingdom about the new coalition overthrowing illiberal laws uh, that had become familiar under new Labour. From a domestic point of view, therefore, if the illiberalism is, is old-fashioned, maybe being a liberal and a freedom lover uh, today, it, it's a good time. But on the other hand, you see conflicts on this issue all the time. An article, uh, just one of many, uh, by Conor Gerty in The Guardian, uh, liberal in name only, uh, they accused the Lib Dems of. But this was not intended, in case anybody thinks it is, uh, an attempt just to talk about the United Kingdom or to talk about the Liberal Democrats, because to be honest with you, if it was, it would be incredibly dull. The idea is, is that we would have a discussion about some of the broader ideas and dilemmas confronting Liberals internationally. Uh, liberals on different sides, left and right, um, have argued some quite illiberal things of late, from banning burqas to banning hate speech to limiting immigration. So we have what some people have called uh, the rise of illiberal liberalism, and certainly any of us who know that if you fall foul of liberal orthodoxies, you can feel the full weight of uh, intolerance. And that was something we were interested in exploring. We've got a great panel. There's Frank Ferredi, a professor of sociology at the University of Canterbury, author of many books, just to name a few, Wasted, his uh, latest book on education, Where Have All the Intellectuals Gone, Politics of Fear, Paranoid Parenting, and actually, as we speak, finishing a book um, on intolerance and tolerance. And he's a battle regular, internationally renowned uh, public intellectual, and uh, somebody who uh, can be relied upon to stir things up and I would say uh, probably universally hated by liberals, even though he calls himself a liberal. Next up we have uh, Nigel Warburton, who's senior lecturer uh, in philosophy at the Open University, uh, the author of a number of books on philosophy, but also pertinently a book called Free Speech, A Very Short Introduction, which I think tackles exactly the kind of dilemmas facing liberals in relation to the free speech issue. He's a regular monthly columnist for Prospect magazine, one of our partners here at the Battle of Ideas. He makes a podcast, a philosophy podcast, Bites, which has nearly 8 million downloads, which is not bad at all, which just shows you that you know, there's an appetite for serious ideas, uh, and so we're delighted that you're here, Nigel. Next up, and I'm delighted she's with us, is Lisa Apanyanese, who I'm sure many of you know from her broadcasting, from her writing. Importantly, for this debate, uh, she's the president of English Pen. She led the campaign against the incitement to religious hatred legislation and edited the book that went with that, published by Penguin, Free Expression is No Offence. She's a novelist, uh, writer, broadcaster, translator, author of Mad, Bad and Sad, general editor of Profile Books' Big Ideas series, which seems appropriate you're at the Institute of Ideas, Battle of Ideas, and she's also uh, the author of prize-winning fiction, uh, The Memory Man. I have to admit now that I'm a bit of a fan. I really love her psychological uh, thrillers, uh, Sanctuary in the Dead of Winter. I've never had the courage to say that to her face, but I'm saying it now. Uh, and then finally, Mark Littlewood, Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs since December 2009. The Institute of Economic Affairs, IEA, is all about furthering the public understanding of the role of free markets and the role they play in social and economic problems. He's previously been, and this is absolutely uh, makes him suitable for this panel, the Communications Director of Progressive Vision, the Head of Media um, at Li for the Liberal Democrats, the National Coordinator of No to ID, Campaigns Director at Liberty, and co-founder of the Orange Book Ginger Group, Liberal Vision. Mark, if you've ever seen him on the television or heard him speak, uh, doesn't take any prisoners, so I'm looking forward to him uh, acting in that tradition today. OK, let's start the debate. Frank, kick us off, please. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, liberalism has always been a very troublesome concept, and in fact, the term liberal you know, is something that wasn't really used in the way that we remotely understand it until about the 19th century, and since that time, it's got a, a variety of different meanings. Uh, I don't want to go into it uh, in a lot of detail, but I would only make one basic point, which is that 
whatever you take liberalism to be, and to me it's very much linked to the tradition of Locke in this country, you know, so J.S. Mill, uh, whatever you take it, take it to be, it, I would argue that contemporary political culture is very inhospitable to the flourishing of liberalism. And this is despite the fact that there are a lot of people that call themselves liberals, you have liberal dev MPs and all the rest of that. I find that it's not just simply that liberalism isn't really flourishing, but that many liberals themselves who call themselves liberals find it very difficult to take their own ethos particularly seriously. And that's really how I began to get very interested in this because uh, I was doing some work on the whole idea of free speech. And I was reading all these books written by liberals and I noticed that they seem to be spending most of their time not arguing the case for free speech but explaining why free speech had to be curbed in a number of different circumstances. You know, inventing some very good reasons as to why free speech is, is really inappropriate in this and that particular kind of domain. And I thought that you know, it's a bit of a problem when, when liberals are devoting their intellectual energy towards finding you know, all these exceptions to the general principle of, of, of free speech and started looking into this in a little bit more detail. And it seems to me that one reason why the freedom of speech has become such a uh, kind of uh, uh, an idea that's so selectively applied, you really do believe robustly in free speech for yourself but not for others. Uh, I think the one reason why that is the case is because people don't understand why it's important. I was uh, involved in a, in a plenary like this in Amsterdam and a lot of people were kind of shaking my hands because I said that you know, people criticizing the Holocaust should have the right to criticize the Holocaust. And I said that even though a lot of my relatives were killed in the Holocaust and everyone thought that was really, really good. But the interesting thing was the same people that, that thought it was brilliant to criticize the Holocaust took exception to anybody that might uh, sort of take the piss out of the Koran. You know, that, that's different, that's a holy book. You couldn't really do that. And many of the people that thought it was you know, sort of uh, inappropriate to take, ask questions about the Holocaust and about its existence thought it was perfectly all right to criticize you know, sort of the Prophet Muhammad. So you could see very clearly there's a kind of a selective approach towards you know, sort of free speech. And, and usually people are very firm in tolerating opinions that they believe in and being intolerant towards others that they don't believe in. That's what it seems to mean. And the reason why that is is because they don't understand that what free speech is really all about, certainly in the way that Mill argued for it, is that he understood that the clash of diverse views wasn't just simply important in its own sense, but it was, a, it was important epistemologically. It was a way of discovering the truth. That in a sense, it's only when, when you have this clash of opinions that, the, that the, the truth could be found. And not only did it have an epistemological significance, free speech and, and liberal tolerance also has a very important ethical, moral dimension to it. And it's important to understand that it's underpinned by ethical, moral concerns because in a sense, it, it's through people being able to pursue the truth for themselves that they internalize ideas about the world in a way that is in line with their own moral autonomy. And I think uh, I would argue that, it, that it, it, it is this which has been most lost in contemporary liberalism. I think that of any single idea about liberalism, the one that's most disrespected or discredited is the idea of individual moral autonomy. In fact, if you don't believe me, just Google individual autonomy and you will find that virtually every, every hit you get takes the piss out of it. It's an impossible ideal, it's an exaggerated thing, it's very individualistic. I mean, there's all these uh, negative comments that are made about the exercise of individual autonomy. And it seems to me that that is, that, that, that is a huge issue. If you, if you recall, one of the points that Mill makes is that it's important for people to act autonomously. It's more important for them to act to act autonomously than, to, than they act correctly. I mean, he basically felt that it, it was far more important to make mistakes, but to do it on your own account, uh, than to be right. Uh, and he made the point that making choices for oneself, choosing autonomously, is more important than making right choices or choosing correctly. And to quote him, he says, it is really of importance not only what men do, but also what manner of men they are that do it. And I think in a sense, you know, what he's really getting at is that human flourishing the, you know, takes place through the pursuit of the truth in line with people having to take moral responsibility for their action. 
and in line with, in a sense, engaging with the world in such a way that opinions that they eventually hold are not just simply received, but they are the product of this existential struggle that they kind of go through. Now, as I said earlier on, in contemporary Western culture, but particularly Anglo-American culture, autonomy is treated predominantly as a myth, especially in academia. And in particular, uh, almost everything that you read uh, calls into question the capacity of people like yourselves or, or, or myself to exercise moral autonomy. I mean, that is invariably seen as being a hopeless exercise in, 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 in funny liberalism. And the, and the way that our culture destroys the idea of moral autonomy is in two ways. The first way we do it, and this is the accomplishment of British culture, particularly in the new labor period, is we have re redefined personhood as vulnerable. People are, are, you know, the default definition of a person is its vulnerability. We're weak, we lack resilience, we cannot really cope. And therefore, by definition, if we are vulnerable, and we even have this word vulnerable adults, vulnerable children, all, all the rest of that, if we're vulnerable, then the implication is, is that we cannot exercise moral agency. Now, we don't, we don't say that, you know, because it's obviously it's a horrible thing to tell people that you, you kind of lack moral agency. We don't say that. In this country, in England, we just tell them you need support. And that's the kind of the general, the euphemism that you know, will give you support is usually another way of saying is that you lack the moral resources to have the potential for individual autonomous behavior. And one of the consequences of giving people support uh, because they lack this moral agency is what I call in my book that's coming out the deauthorization of the private sphere. Increasingly, the private sphere as, as, a, as a sphere within which uh, autonomous individuals can reflect, can think about who they are, uh, is, is more or less being uh, attacked, stigmatized, eroded, kind of called into question. There's a number of different ways that's being done. I just want to give you one example because I haven't got very much time. But one of the most pernicious ideas that is making the rounds of, the, of our political elites uh, is what, what's called in, in America civic republicanism, which are the ideas that are associated with Richard Thaler and Cass Sustein. It's interesting that Thaler and, and, and Sustein are very popular with the Obama administration. They were very popular with the Brown administration. And Nick Clegg and Cameron also liked them a hell of a lot. Uh, in fact, it's, 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 it's interesting the concept that they developed, uh, these civic republicans. They promoted the idea of what's called libertarian paternalism. Interesting idea, libertarian paternalism, which you would, you would have thought uh, is sufficiently inconsistent, a contradiction in, in term uh, as to uh, demand another way of, of talking about it. And the other phrase they use is what they call choice architecture. Uh, Again, a very interesting idea. Basically, they're going to build your choices for you. Uh, and what, the, what this concept of libertarian paternalism implies, along with choice architecture, is that the state can be an architect that arranges personal choice in a way that nudges, you know, sort of kind of cut consumers in the right direction. And if you've probably seen all this discussion about nudge, which sounds very inoffensive, you know, it's not kind of kicking you, kicking you in the rear end, they're kind of nudging you. But when you look at the Orwellian sounding uh, behavioral insight team that the government has set up uh, following the uh, previous uh, administration's wellness and happiness kind of, kind of committees, uh, you can see the kind of problems that we have because basically the main objective of libertarian paternalism is the colonization of private life. I mean, that's basically what it's really all about. You colonize the, you know, private life by trying to, in a sense, uh, nudge people into forms of behavior uh, that, are, that are more consistent with government objectives, uh, basically what you're trying to do is to re-educate, reprogram people in line with what's going on. Now, there are a number of problems with this that I haven't got time to go into, but I think that the most important problem is this for a liberal, which is that liberal theory presupposes the existence of two very different jurisdictions, the private sphere and the public sphere. And we, and we recognize that actually both depend on each other. It's not that one is better than the other, but we recognize that a private sphere is a sphere where individuals can develop the, the, the kind of resources they need to exercise moral autonomy, which is then in the public sphere uh, further developed through clashes of ideas, through politics and all the public activities that, that we kind of know and love. Now, one of the trouble that we have is that 
as the state expands into the private sphere, what, you have a situation where the relationship between the private and the public goes the wrong kind of a way. And the way that it works is that the state is increasingly identifying the private sphere as its main domain for activity. I mean, almost all social policy now is about nudging. Right? It's about you know, gently nudging you in the way they want it. And, and they even use the expression, we, you know, sort of, we're there to help you make the right choices. I think it's an interesting idea. We're help, you're gonna make the right, in other words, you're gonna make the choices that we think are right. That's basically what they're saying. If you make the choices they think are wrong, then you know, that, that's the wrong choice. So on the one hand, you have the private sphere, the jurisdiction being managed by nudger, nudgers, relationship experts, social workers, workers, and a number of professionals. But at the same time, the public sphere, which is, should be really public, is being privatized. So you get the worst of both worlds. On the one hand, you have more and more mercenaries you know, being employed in the, in the public sphere, more and more public activities being given out to private uh, 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 kind, of, kind of companies who have no public ethos as such, who have no, no public spirit in the Republican, in a, in a proper Republican kind of sense. And you have a situation where, you know, sort of you have this relationship the wrong way around. The private sphere becomes the main area of state activity and the public sphere becomes privatized. So you get the worst of both worlds under those circumstances, which makes it impossible for autonomy to have a real existence and a real impact upon public life because in practice it is both culturally devalued and institutionally marginalized. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is I don't think liberalism is one single thing. It's a name for a cluster of related positions and there are greater and lesser degrees of liberalism, something which we could perhaps come back to in the conversation that's going to follow this. But the main point that I want to make is that liberalism has always been about where you draw the line, the line between liberty and license. It's never been philosophically about total freedom. And it's very misleading to give the impression that, for instance, John Locke, you know, the patron saint of liberalism, didn't draw the line between liberty and license. For instance, in what he said about religious toleration in the second letter on, um, on toleration, he, he argued that it's very important that we tolerate a wide range of um, religious positions, but not that we tolerate Catholics. Um, he was very clear about that. We shouldn't tolerate Catholics because they're enthralled to a foreign prince, and we shouldn't tolerate atheists because you can't trust the promises they make because they don't swear on a Bible or any holy book. So, you know, just to take John, John Locke as this great liberal thinker, he, he very clearly drew the lines between those we should tolerate and those we shouldn't tolerate. Similarly, John Stuart Mill, whose name has already been invoked, you know, his great little book on liberty doesn't encourage liberty either for uh, children. You know, you're supposed to be paternalistic towards children or maternalistic. Uh, you're supposed to do things for their own good, protect them from their own um, desires and so on. But also, uh, people in, um, peoples in, I, I forget the ex exact phrase, but something like the nonage, in their nonage, you know, these emerging cultures were not supposed to be given freedom, uh, nor were people with um, psychiatric problems. And even when we talk about free speech, the limits on free speech for Mill are very clear. You tolerate free speech up to the point where it's an incitement to violence. So again, Mill circumscribes the area which, within which he wants to say there is a good kind of freedom, and there's a bad kind of freedom, the freedom that, that goes beyond that circumscribed area. Um, so I think it's very easy to, to talk about liberalism as if, as if we're talking about complete license, and that's a, that, I think, is a kind of fallacious style of reasoning. If you still think that in the area of free speech that you, know, you as a defender of free speech want to defend free speech right up to the limit of, 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 of incitement to violence, what do you say about false advertising? You know, we don't, do we want free speech for false advertisers? Or um, do we want um, freedom to shout fire in a crowded building? You know, this is a classic example that Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. used. Or even with literature, there's a, there's a classic case of a book called Hitman, which was presented as fiction, but was basically an instruction manual published in the 80s, 1980s, that, um, that told you how to have a career as a hitman. And it was based on uh, information gleaned from, 
from crime novels and so on. And the, the terrible thing about this book was that it was actually used as a practical guide by somebody who became a DIY hitman and murdered several people. And there's a big case about whether this book should have been um, suppressed or not. And there's an interesting case. You know, would, would, would a liberal want to allow that book to go out? Would a liberal want a recipe for nerve gas to go on the internet? Um, these are interesting questions for people who want to defend free speech up to the limits. I mean, my main point here is that free speech is all, free, issues about free speech, issues about liberalism are always about line drawing. They always have philosophically been about that. If I wouldn't like to be called a ginger rodent. Um, you know, Harriet Harman chose to use that language recently of Danny Alexander in public. And you know, this is, I think, an unacceptable, offensive piece of language because of, it wasn't used in the context in a, in, a, in a pleasant, joking way. It was actually meant in quite a pejorative way. But it's the sort of thing which obviously we in a civilised society should tolerate. I also believe that we should tolerate Holocaust deniers because what we need in this, in this world is, is the opportunity to refute in detail the people who express views which are false. And similarly, Harriet Harman is, is now feeling the force of not just redheads but... Um, people who, who believe that um, there, are, there are serious consequences for children in schools of, of making disparaging remarks about the physical appearance of people. Just to sum up, I mean, I, th I, I think that in this discussion we could talk in generalities about liberalism, but if we do, I think we're going to just increase the amount of hot air in this room, and I think there's plenty there already. I think I took this question in, in a rather personal way and, and really had to think since my children are always telling me I'm a liberal, what do I actually mean by this? Um, for myself, and so this is not a party political platform in any way, and, you know, I have at points in my life read my lock and my mill and my even roles to a certain extent, and of course pain. Um, and I think since I have written fiction for my sins and therefore put myself in many characters' minds, um, and indeed also worked as a historian, then I think for me the primary quality of what liberal means to me today now is a kind of a certain scepticism about both received ideas, received wisdoms, and various kinds of political platforms that are rolled out for our supposed benefit and happiness. So, so the sceptical side of liberalism is, is where I would fall. If I, if I think of any, the positive content of what I mean by liberalism, which is, of course, its presumption um, that in favor of liberty, which I think is an important one, and by liberty, of course, I don't mean impeach Obama before liberty dies. I mean, not the Tea Party liberty. Um, but, but for me, on the positive side, what it probably involves, and, and I think this will have a ring of a certain kind of elitism, but it's a kind of elite which I would hope would be accessible to everyone, and I'm very taxed about education, university education, so maybe, but maybe we can come back to that. So on the positive side of what I mean, by liberals is really a kind of emancipatory project based on the value of informed thinking and a keep an, uh, keeping open both of the mind and society um, and a valuing of that bundle that comes with the old humanisms, thinking, the arts, um, which allow, I think, the individual to become uh, a, 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 a fuller individual, allow the individual to flourish in Aristotelian terms. And I think for me, being a liberal also somehow involves growing antennae which are sensitive to any encroachments on liberty by the holders of power. Now, traditionally, that has meant the power of the state, and we can see this in totalitarian states. It's very clear that that's the first center of power, but there are many other centers of power about which one would want to be, um, I don't know, sensitive to the encroachments that they would have on individual liberty. Um, one, of course, principally is religion, um, or indeed any, any kind of overly powerful media empire, or a political bureaucracy which seems to be invisible, something that Frank is very good at, at uh, sussing out the, the, the kind of underlying factors of. Um, and indeed any group that becomes too powerful and, and feels that its ideas are the ones which have supremacy over all others. Now that doesn't mean I'm a relativist in any total sense, but it means that I'm skeptical of power and worry about the kind of shutting down of thinking, expression, and indeed movement that these kinds of, of powers will have. And one of the primary, my, my primary training ground in this, I always think, was the, the kind of moment of 
um, feminism or women's liberation, where one actually had to question all the received ideas that, that men had really given us about who we were and what we were. So, and I think that one continues to be important. Now, I should say that my understanding of the individual, individual autonomy and individual freedom, also, I also have a caveat about what um, free and thinking mean, because I don't think um, individuals are totally rational. I don't think they can make rational choices at all times. We're always, all of us, under certain kinds of pressure. I mean, for example, as Claire well knows, I'm a smoker, and I would love to take out a fag right now. Um, but I know that this is not something that would um, endear me to all of you, and also is something that might cause you harm. So as in the area of free speech, and free thinking and free access to speech. Um, I think it's, it, there are certain kinds of limitations which have to do, as you said, with violence, and I would say harm rather than hurt. Hurt is something in the area of free speech we feel every day of our lives. I'm hurt when I, I feel offended uh, when I see too much garbage on the streets. You know, I'd like to sit down and pick, I mean, I'd like to move and pick it up, and I, that, that, that offends me. But that, that's not an area for either legislation, something we showed in the free expression is no offense campaign, um, nor is it something that we should get too excited about. We just talk back. Debate is very crucial. We can talk back to received ideas. We can talk back where we hurt. But if we're actually harmed, if there's violence or indeed uh, military force or indeed you know, that kind of suppressing religious power, then um, the... the, the um, need for total free expression becomes ever more acute. Well, I, I just wanted to, to cite, I mean, because we always hear about this, and I'm, I'm very fond of Isaiah Berlin, I, and when Vargas Llosa, the, the mm -hmm. Peruvian writer, won the Nobel, because I so love his fiction, I went back to read some of his essays, and I found one on Isaiah Berlin, which I, which I thought was very interesting for us here today. Vargas Llosa suddenly approves of Berlin. This is in, in the moment before he became a kind of right-wing libertarian, and, but had left his um, love affair with communism. And uh, at, one, at that point in his life, he was very much a Castro supporter and so on. So he, he says about Berlin, um, uh, the philosopher who gave us the idea of negative liberty, in other words, liberalism which doesn't talk primarily of rights or free markets or abstract ideas of justice and fairness. But for Berlin, who after all lived through two world wars and, and the great moments of totalitarianism, the heart of liberty is simply the absence of coercion by others. The liberal state's role, therefore, is to protect liberty. Its job is to ensure that it doesn't practice coercion and that citizens do not coerce each other without compelling justification, which is, of course, not something we saw through the various um, uh, periods of the last Labour government mm -hmm. and why I think I did find myself uh, voting Lib Dem at the last election. You can ask me later what I think now. <laughs> but but just, just to go on about Vargas Llosa, uh, he says about Isaiah Berlin that he's aware of the obligations that economic, cultural, and political conditions bring to bear on this option for freedom and is a clear defender of pluralism, that is, of tolerance and of the coexistence of different ideas and forms of life and a resolute uh, opponent of any form of despotism. Now, Vargas Llosa turned against communism when uh, uh, the writer uh, Eberto Padilla, the, the Cuban poet, actually after Castro's very successful revolution, began to criticize the uh, Cuban state and was summarily first put under surveillance, um, uh, 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 an introduction put to his book by, forced on his book by the Writers Union, which actually undermined everything that he had said within the, the poetry collection and eventually imprisoned. And a great many, um, at that point, left-wing intellectuals rose up against this particular, um, uh, what, uh, I don't know, undermining of free expression by the, the, the communist state and um, decided that this was not where they belonged. Anyhow, that, that's a little bit about defense for free expression. I had a lot more to say. We'll leave it for the discussion. I'm going to say a bit about what I think it means to be a liberal today, not what I think the sort of definition of liberalism is. Uh, and I'm not going to be particularly philosophical about it. I'm going to be relatively practical about it except what Nigel said about it not being an absolutist position to be a liberal. 
But my broad definition, and the one I'm comfortable with, is that being a liberal means that you are happy for people to go to hell in a handcart in their own merry way. And uh, that would be the guiding principle that I would apply to many of the considerations we face today in society. And I would have thought most liberals, uh, at least in Britain, and I would think this is true actually right across the Western world and beyond, need to have a concern probably verging on apoplexy, not merely about the absolute size of the state, but about its scope. And it seems to me that arguments about the size of the state are often those that divide, if you like, left-wing or social liberals from free market liberals such as myself. I do consider a state which controls nearly 50% of the economy to be an abomination that limits freedom by justification, uh, definitionally. I think that, that a growing state economically inhibits freedom. But I want to focus on an area which I think might unite, uh, if you like, right-leaning liberals or classical liberals and social liberals, and that's about scope. And it goes to a little about what Frank was saying about the private sphere and the public sphere, because there is increasingly virtually no area of day-to-day -day life which the public sector now leaves alone. The public sphere is imposing in all sorts of ways, not just in health, education and pensions, those services that you might think have some public use, but in what we eat, what we drink, whether we choose to smoke, where we can choose to smoke, what adverts can be put up to encourage us to do these things that might be, uh, might be bad for us. So I think the scope of the state is what needs to concern liberals, and in particular, the growing influence and wider interpretation of the harm principle. We've already heard about the shouting fire in a crowded uh, theater, or uh, my right to swing my fist ends at the end of your nose. But the extension of this harm principle has become monumental in modern life. And to pick up, for example, the issue of the consumption of tobacco. I think we now have the madness that we live in a society in which a, I think a 16 or 17 year old man or woman can volunteer to serve for their army in Afghanistan or Iraq, but cannot serve me a gin and tonic in a bar while I smoke a Marlboro Light because the second activity is considered to be too dangerous and injurious to their health as a professional. And that strikes me as an extension of the harm principle, which is entirely ludicrous. Uh, it is acceptable in some circumstances, I go so far as to say in many circumstances, to engage in activities which cause other people harm. It doesn't mean necessarily out and out physical violence, but harm is acceptable. And I think that we need to see a considerable rolling back of the width and breadth of the harm principle in our society. Causing offence, that's, uh, that's been stated uh, and, and touched on already. Where do you actually draw the line there? That's not been, in my view, just a legal matter. It has been a, a cultural one. Uh, Harriet Harman's been mentioned already. I'm very loath to leap to her uh, defence. But it seems to me that we have a, a cultural problem here about expressing criticism rather than a legal one. And whilst you might well consider that calling Danny Alexander the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, is a, uh, uh, calling him a ginger rodent, is um, unbecoming of the Office of Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, what seems to me to be completely insane, utterly mad, is that she seems to have retracted and apologised for calling him ginger, <laughs> not for calling him a rodent. <laughs> the, 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 the entire offence clause was around the colour of his hair, which seems to me is a, is a matter of public record and indeed fact. And, and that, that's the element of it which seems to cause the most offence, an extraordinary contorted culture about what constitutes offence and what doesn't. I think liberals also in, in, in the modern world need to be characterised by, I'm not sure I'd go so far as to say encouraging risk, but certainly being comfortable with it and accepting that a good deal of meaningful human behaviour requires risk and that the individuals that take those risks, rather than being deterred from taking them, just need to accept the consequences of living with them. And that goes not just to lifestyle issues, but to security issues. Um, uh, I heard earlier today a BBC broadcaster 
cross-examining a senior politician um, on the back of the East Midlands uh, episode with the, the bomb having been caught or the apparent bomb having been uh, intercepted and prevented. And the question was, what can we do to eliminate the risk of such bombs ever being placed on a British plane? Not reduce, eliminate the risk. And th this points to me again to a culture in which we are just too risk adverse. I mean, I'm not saying that you should just be able to, you know, walk onto a plane with your Kalashnikov and whatever um, dangerous explosives you want to carry in your, put in your carry-on luggage. But we are in danger of allowing ourselves to believe that risk can be eliminated altogether. And I think so another thing that liberals need to do is to reject many of the arguments about balance. Everybody is seem to accept, and certainly modern politicians perpetrate the view that civil liberties and security need to be put into balance. Now, this might be true in some cases, okay? If we are concerned about somebody in this room having a bomb and setting it off, we could have mitigated that risk by having enormous security checks on the door and it taking three or four hours for everybody to come in and everybody perhaps having to be strip searched and so on and so forth. We could mitigate that risk. But the assumption that there is always a trade-off, I think, it is an extremely dangerous one. There seems to be, although they never quantify it, an assumption that if you accept, I don't know, sort of one gigawatt less of freedom, you will automatically get 1.5 gigawatts more of, of um, security. And I think that we need to reject that entirely. Our final, the final point I want to make is just a tactical one. And that's that I think liberals need to accept more that we have recently been roundly defeated. We have not lived in a world uh, in recent years in which there is a liberal consensus far from it. Uh, my own view is that there isn't a catastrophe in neoliberalism, there's actually a failure to practice neoliberalism. We live in a social democratic consensus. And the immediate prospects in the United Kingdom for altering that, I think, are mixed. The big, bold and brave idea of the new coalition government here is supposed to be the big society, but nobody can define what it means. On occasions, the Prime Minister seems to be talking about a complete recalibration of the relationship between the individual and the state. On other occasions, he seems to be doing no more than applauding the Cub Scouts and the Rotary Club, who are no doubt are institutions worthy of applause. And I think a challenge for liberals is whether some of the narrative, which sounds more liberal in some ways, which has entered our discourse, can actually be properly captured and bottomed out for a more liberal Britain in the years to come. Thank you. I have to say that if I read The Hitman, I wouldn't become The Hitman. I mean, I wouldn't become a Hitman. You just use that as though it's self-evident, and I just wasn't sure that they were either self-evident in terms of your line drawing, but were you just using them as challenges to the line? Yeah. I wasn't saying there's a clear-cut answer. No, there. no, fine. Actually, what I was trying to say was that individuals have to make up their own minds about difficult cases, and it's not a, a matter of simply applying a principle of freedom, and you can immediately see how that cashes out. I mean, was there a danger of you having no lines, or is the lines, or, you know, without ever doing it? Yeah, there's a line which is that uh, the freedom of speech is absolute, you know, without condition, that's the line. Now, Locke made a distinction between uh, belief and opinion and action, and I think that there's, as long as you understand there's a, di there's a distinction between the two, we need to uphold the inviolability of free speech, it's an absolute right, otherwise it's not a freedom anymore, it becomes you know, something that you can practice on Monday and Tuesday, but on Wednesday, you have very good reason as to why it doesn't really kind of work. And if you take Lisa's point about skepticism seriously, and you do have to be a bit skeptical because we do live in uncertain times, then one of the ways you deal with uncertainty is by being open to people saying terrible things, wrong things, erring in opinions, as, as part and parcel of, of, of dealing with, you know, sort of that existential reality that we're kind of confronted with. And, I am really worried about how difficult it is. I mean, you know, we talk about liberalism being defeated, and you're absolutely right. I am really worried that in academia, free speech is almost as an inverted mark around it. It's always kind of seen as a, a really idiotic, old-fashioned idea. And as I said, I, you know, it is the case that virtually everybody I encounter in these discussions spends far more of their intellectual energies at telling us why free speech cannot be applied in these circumstances than in putting up a robust argument as to why you should. 
And it's linked to the point you made about the, the harm principle, because one of the things that has done is as the harm principle expands more and more, so you know, speech becomes offensive and therefore hurt, it becomes traumatizing. I mean, we, we now have this, this idea in America that free speech you know, really traumatizes and psychologically screws up people and all the rest of that. Then, of course, under those circumstances, the territory for freedom to state an opinion is tremendously compromised. On the um, web, people are constantly stating their opinion in very, very loud and noisy terms, and terms which a lot of people might think are hurtful to them. Or, you know, and um, probably are. And yeah. probably are. Yeah, sure. so, so, you know, and I, like you, I'm, I'm more absolute about free speech than Frank, but I don't think if it actually takes violence with it, if it has the force of arms with it, um, then it's something that I would probably want. I, if, as long as it's in the area of words, it's fine. And does that mean that, Frank, you think that um, if someone were to write a, a tract um, celebrating the joys of paedophilia, um, explaining how to carry out all kinds of acts of um, sexual violence against children, you think that's perfectly tolerable? You think that's something which should be free, defended on free speech grounds? You said the words that you thought it's an absolute right to free speech, something like that? Was, uh, you but think it's an absolute... You said you two different you things. It's not about drawing lines. Okay. Okay. You said two different things. You said uh, a, a manual praising the virtues of pedophilia, no problem. Uh, I think that's entirely legitimate. That's biting uh, the bullet. That's, sorry? What it's, that's what I would call biting the bullet. I mean, if you really believe that... Well, we, we, we you know, that I, mean, unless, I don't know that you need a manual to be a uh, paedophile as an uh, aside, but unless, I know... Unless, you know. <laughs> unless we have the courage of our conviction to isolate and marginalise those ideas, how else are we going to develop the arguments against, you know, per, you know the you know, perversion of our freedoms, except by en engaging with it? And it seems to me by suppressing uncomfortable, horrible things, we're, we're, we're finding bureaucratic solutions to what are cultural and intellectual problems. And what do you, what do, you do about Lolita? I mean, you know, th there is a, there's a very tricky area here. I mean, some people would actually ban Lolita because it's a book that encourages pedophilia. Um, the def the the sort of notion of pedophilia is very different in Lolita than it might be in a manual about how to entrap children onto your website. And, and so, you know. I think that's quite different thing. the case I gave, because I mean, people would defend Lolita on its literary merits, on the fact that you have psychological insights into a character and you can see how corrupt he is as a character. No, but if you had a law that actually didn't allow any kind of. Um, descriptions of pedophilia. Oh no, but I'm, I'm saying, you know, there, this is about line drawing, exactly, exactly the case. So you say, what are the justifications for drawing it here rather than there, rather than Frank's approach, which say, everything goes. I wanted to get your, uh, sort of, almost like a one line from all of you before I go to the audience, actually, on religious toleration and religious freedom, which was one of the things that prompted this discussion as well. Because one of the things I found it from, as it were, my peers on the Liberal uh, wing was how intolerant and illiberal they came when it came to religion. Even though religion is intolerant, suddenly we became intolerant to religion on the basis that it was intolerant, which seemed to be mad. But anyway, Mark. Just particularly on this freedom of speech point, uh, I, I do think that Nigel's right that there's a difficulty here. There is a problem. I'm not sure I'm quite as absolutist as Frank. We've had a slightly academic discussion about what books might be banned, but freedom of speech goes beyond the publication of books. If you do accept that, that some acts of conspiracy should be criminal offences, then you also have a problem with freedom of speech. I'm not saying I've got an answer to it, but if the five of us sit in a room and I'm circulating documents about how to plan this armed robbery and exactly which door you're going to go through, marked out on the blueprints, and you four carry out the armed robbery and come away with the money, am I guilty of anything or have I just asserted my freedom of speech by circulating these blueprints and, and advising you on how to pull the trigger to shoot the cashier? It strikes me that there are problems uh, when, when direct conspiracy and a direct plan is intended and freedom of speech But then is that, that's, that's an act, that's a context yes. uh, of an act, and therefore it's not free speech. You, you're basically dealing with a crime. Well, I think it's at what point does the manual become a blueprint for committing a crime and at what point is the manual merely something that people you know, might refer to and it's not obvious to me that there's a simple answer to that one on religion, I, I mean uh, I, I, I take a pretty straightforward view on this, I mean I'm tolerant of everybody else's re religious views in the sense that I think people have a right to express them but I think other people have a right to protest against them and say how utterly mad they think these things are, I'm an atheist myself and uh, I don't mind if people want to believe in what I consider to be imaginary friends. 
but uh, <laughs> I don't uh, feel any obligation whatsoever to tread carefully in attacking what I believe to be the nonsense of a lot of religion. You know, faith is fine, everybody in the private sphere, even, even the, the private sphere which no longer is being encroached on. Um, of course, you know, people believe and, and that's just fine with me. Religion in the public sphere, when it becomes a kind of dominant discourse, I think is always dangerous to all kinds of liberalisms, which, um, because it, it, it takes on too much constrictive weight and I would fight against it. I mean, I, I thought, I mean, you know, I'm, it's not that I wasn't tolerant of the Pope, I disagree with what he says. He yeah. gets more airtime than I do. Yeah, I'm obviously in favor of religious toleration, um, but it shouldn't, nothing should be sacrosanct. There shouldn't be a sense in which we can't offend, mock, caricature other religions. Um, that, you know, it's very important that we have free speech. I'm, I'm actually in danger of being caricatured in this debate as somebody who's opposed to free speech, but I think I probably want to defend a stronger line on free speech than, than our legal system actually does. So I'm quite far down the route towards absolute free speech anyways. But I, I think you know, religion is very important to people. It's a matter of respect to, to allow other people to have core ethical beliefs and, and misguided beliefs about what's going to happen after their death. That's, that, I think that's, that's important, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't somehow um, be frightened of, of offending religious people by, by mocking their beliefs if, if we think they're false. Yeah, I, mean, I think Locke is very good on this because he makes the point that you cannot ban people's beliefs on religious grounds or their practices, but it's quite legitimate to ban their activities on if they break the law. And, and therefore, that's, that seems to me to be a very sensible way of, of kind of proceeding, that uh, everybody's got to respect the law, but people's beliefs and opinions are, are their own business. And I think that is something we need to uh, sort of, kind of affirm very, very important because religion is becoming one of the most important areas within which intolerance in different forms and different guises uh, is developing at the moment to, to, to our surprise because we never expected that to occur. Ursula Le Guin said, uh, having intelligence, we must not act in ignorance. Having freedom, we must not act without responsibility. Um, and I, I, I want to say to Frank, um, it seems to me always there's this problem, difference between free utterance and free speech. I think when we defend free speech, we tend to think always in terms of your moral autonomy, that the importance is for the individual to exercise moral autonomy, to exercise responsibility in their speech mode. And I think the thing that we have a, a problem with and dividing line problem with is this concept of just free utterance. Uh, I don't think it's acceptable for people just to rant off foul-mouthed abuse. Um, and I don't think many people would th think that was acceptable. I'm not even sure you would think that that is acceptable. I think, in your own words, you would want individuals to exercise their moral autonomy in deciding what it is that is appropriate to say. Can we think of ways that uh, liberalism can be constructively uh, used in institutions, in government, apart from what individuals do in their private life? My, my question is about the, uh, the, the, the match between the employment contract and autonomy. I see the employment contract as removing the essence of moral autonomy, that is, you, you do, you're deprived of any right to information, any right to influence, your voice has no right to be heard as an employee, and you have no right to participate in the wealth that, the, that your work creates. And all those rights are given to the theoretical owner, which is not actually a property, a property right that he has. So my, my proposal is that we should ban the... Uh, employment contract and make everybody an, a partner, which is how, func how companies actually function. Last point, the best way to undermine a company is to make a special effort to meet your employment contract, that is to, to work to rule. And that shows that actually it is moral autonomy that makes things work, it needs to be recognized. Yeah, um, I think we sort of drifted a little bit into the free speech discussion, but we forgot the main question of the session, what, what does it mean to be a liberal today? Um, and I think there's this idea today that there's a negative connotation uh, to being a liberal. If you take, for example, uh, the case of Mario Vargas Llosa, and that didn't happen so much when he won the Nobel Prize, it didn't happen so much in um, the British press, but 
in the Arab press, which uh, I follow closely, uh, there was a lot of accusations that how can you give the Nobel Prize for Literature for, to a liberal, especially a liberal that was a leftist and now is a liberal. So A, there's this connotation that being a liberal in itself is a bad thing. Two, we hear a lot about neoliberalism today. And it's also associated a lot with negative, and I say it comes from a lot of shrill lefty type thinking, but I would like to hear your uh, elaboration on that because I personally don't think there's anything called neoliberalism. It's just a fake construct, but I would like to hear what your thoughts on that are. I just wanted to come, to come back to what was discussed on the panel in terms of uh, the Lolita and the films and the books. Um, and where we might draw the line. And my question really is, well, who's going to draw that line? Who's going to decide what I should and shouldn't be looking at? Because surely the public being in control of society means that we should be exposed to everything to make up our own minds about what's right and wrong, rather than being told. This starts off as a free speech point, and it goes to what the lady at the back was saying and what Liz Apinionese was saying, but it broadens out a bit. John Mortimer, the late John Mortimer, uh, said he was going to found a society for the protection of mediocre literature <laughs> on, per, per, on the grounds that in those days there was a, a literary merit offense, uh, defense to uh, obscenity publications. It's not sufficient to be able to free, be free to do things well. You have to be free to do them badly as well. Mark made the very good point about the spurious argument from balance uh, and I'd like to take that a little bit further and address the point about the divide between liberty and license. I don't think you can tell you've got freedom until somebody is abusing it and making a mess of their life. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make the point that uh, everyone's fine with religious tolerance. That's a very liberal view. But I think maybe a more modern, more neoliberal problem could be as the church or as religion and state starts to come together with more religious state institutions, how is liberalism going to deal with this when everything has to be tolerant, but at the same time, there is very much an emphasis on having a public and a private sphere, and we can see these two starting to merge more and more. How can we deal with this? What, what are the solutions that liberals can, can offer? I think we need to clarify that most of the discussion about where we draw the line was about where we, I think, was about where we draw the line in law and there's another question about morality, which is not necessarily the same question because there are all kinds of pragmatic considerations that come in when you make a law that aren't, doesn't make the extent of the law exactly um, uh, take, take up the same space as, as, as the moral issues. So I, don't, I think we shouldn't confuse those two things. And just to, to make one um, point again that I've made already, that if we are seriously, to, you know, on the free speech point, if we are still saying that everything goes, does that mean false advertising goes? Does that mean um, if I claim to have got a, a, a medicine that will cure cancer, I, I should be free to claim I've got medical evidence to back that up, even if it's a quack um, medicine? At, at English Pen, we, we've been running, we've run many campaigns, one of them the um, one against the uh, awfulness of the religious hatred bill, actually managed to put a free speech amendment into um, of the criminal law, which forcefully and robustly stated what the limits of speech were. And, and that meant that you were indeed allowed to satirize, laugh at, mock, argue with, criticize any uh, aspects of religion. Um, in other words, faith is a system of thought, and we're able to do that. And that was part of working you know, through government, if you like, to actually change legislation. At the moment, we've been uh, working to change or reform the libel laws, which takes up um, something that came up here. And one of the difficulties of the libel laws is that they're unjust and only really open to the rich to use because it's so expensive to use them. And they do chill speech. They chill it in many ways. They chill it by um, ensuring that all public publishers have any book which may have anything even vaguely libelous in it, read for libel by lawyers and often changed before it actually comes into the public sphere and indeed perhaps not, never gets into the public sphere at all. It makes publishers very shy of certain kinds of material. In the world of science, as we've seen through the entirety of the Simon Singh case, which he bravely fought, the, the um, I, mean, I, I don't want to go into the details here and it's all rather complicated but, but he was actually being sued for using the word 
or putting into doubt the claims made by the British Chiropractic um, uh, Association. And, and um, you know, this was really a battle between science of various kinds. Other kinds of scientists are constantly being um, silenced by something called peer review, which is not within the remit of the, the, the libel laws, but, and peer review is often cheated on. So we have all kinds of, of you know, um, ways in which speech is, is skewered and certainly not free enough in the scientific domain, in the intellectual domain, and, and you know, within what we consider to be every or ordinary, everyday publishing. So reform of the libel laws is another way of working with government. All three parties signed up to this in their manifestos before the last election. Uh, the Tories and the Lib Dems have told us that it is going to go through in one form or another. There has been a private member's bill from the Lords and so on. So th there are many things you can do in government. That's only the beginning. My, my bugbear here um, and where I feel as, as a you know, responsible public per person and a parent that there is something very, very wrong with what our government has been doing is the subsidy of faith schools by the government. And it seems to me that it, you know, it's fine to have private schools, but they have to be private. But faith is a private occupation. It is not something that I necessarily want to subsidize with my taxes. And through the school system, this happens. And, um, you know, I would like, if I weren't involved in other spheres, to actually have a campaign against that, because I think it's, it's a very bad form of government um, subsidy. I would make just one point, which is that um, all this discussion that we had so far on free speech drawing lines is actually uh, a discussion about people's idea about what a person is. How much autonomy can we expect the people to exercise responsibly? If you think that people are shallow idiots, then you will shield them from advertising of all sorts. And there are a lot of people making all kinds of proposals that if you have a, a person enjoying a cigarette on television, then that's going to mean that all of us are gonna go out and become smokers because we're that kind of people. And we have people who insist that it's wrong for children to see certain kinds of things. And that kind of infantilized model of what we are has expanded tremendously. And, and, and there are all these helpful people that are telling us what we can see or hear and what we shouldn't see or hear. And I think that's, that's really, a, you know, it, it, it kind of comes across the discussion about speech, about freedom to do that. But more fundamentally, it's about what a human being is really all about. And it seems to me, that if liberalism has been defeated, has been suggested, or is, has got a setback, it's because that argument about personhood has been lost. Because a, a, a tremendously impoverished view of what a person is, a, a kind of degraded sense of subjectivity that's dependent, that relies on professional input, that requires millions of social workers to hold their hands, that idea of what a person is, is what dominates our society. And you cannot have a dynamic liberal theory that really means something unless we uh, sort of uh, kind of sort that very fundamental problem out. That's, a, that's, why, that's, that's got the logical priority or everything else in terms of development of liberal ideals. This is another cliche that liberals need to destroy. With freedom comes responsibility. Absolute nonsense. Uh, I believe that people have freedoms and they have responsibilities, but to believe that they are equivalent, and there's always a flip side of every freedom, to uh, there's an there's a, um, equal responsibility attached to it, is utterly, utterly wrong, and I think intrinsically illiberal. And I, I know it's wrong because I often exercise my own freedom in an extremely irresponsible fashion. <laughs> if, you'd see, if you'd seen how much I'd had to drink on Friday night, given I had to give a lecture at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning, would be testament to it. Um, the... The fake advertising point, I don't see where Nigel's going with this. I mean, I, I'd rather take Claire's quip that all advertising is fake. But surely your freedom of expression extends beyond only being able to say things which are accurate. Uh, an example, the truth that happened to me uh, yesterday morning, I was given a leaflet on the street that said, if I accepted Jesus Christ as my saviour and turned up at this local church, I would be guaranteed eternal life. I don't think the person giving me that leaflet was able to adduce any concrete scientific evidence for this proposition. <laughs> I don't know whether that would count as fake advertising. And this is, a, this is an area in which, again, the harm principle has become ludicrously extended. There can be contractual failures. If you're promising to do X in return for a certain fee for a good or service, you may be sued if that good or service doesn't provide what it claims to. But we need to get away from 
the sort of idiocy that my former party adopted as a policy that you know any photo uh, advertisement would have to, that was airbrushed there would have to be a sort of label on the bottom saying that you know this photograph has been airbrushed Liz Hurley had a slight zit on her forehead that day that we've airbrushed it out and it, it is this sort of ludicrous paternalism I've tried to press uh, Jo Swinson on whether she also thinks that Star Wars should be, begin with a warning that it does not feature real alien spacecraft. <laughs> um, and she seems silent on that point. So f- fake advertising is absolutely acceptable. Just coming back to Nigel Warburton's um, uh, position about drawing lines, um, my personal view is that while people have a right to make their own behavioural choices, they should pay the consequences. They should pay for the consequences of them. And the two biggest single costs to our national health service are alcohol abuse and, I'm afraid, smoking. Uh, so they should be higher taxes. Perhaps those taxes should be hypothecated. Perhaps they should be charged more for. They should be charged for a hospital admission. But they should pay for the consequences of their own behaviours. Just the second point is the gun lobby in the states, of course, relies on or abuses this term in the constitution about the right uh, to carry arms. I think very few of us would want to go down that road. Now we would support the government in this ter- in, in this sense, an intervention. Uh, that actually gun uh, ownership in this country should be very strictly regulated and very strictly monitored. I think the discussion about liberalism is a little bit problematic in the sense that if you, if you take the idea of where it emerges from, then there's two strands that I think retrospectively get fused together and get described as liberalism. So you have the kind of negative idea of freedom, which, you know, and then you've got the more Republican side of things, which was the participatory aspect of like the robust individual that is often involved in military service and that's what gave them their kind of ability to steadfastly hold a respected opinion amongst their peers. Those, Those two ideas can sit next to each other but they were distinct strands that retrospectively were lumped together in opposition to Marxism. The difficulty you've got is in trying to resurrect a a classical sense of liberalism today in the absence of what actually formed them and gave them a coherence in terms of our modern understanding of it, is problematic. You can't resurrect a classic idea of liberalism when the conditions that shaped it have completely changed. I've got a great deal of sympathy with what, <clears throat> with what Frank Frady says, having just read um, on liberty, the whole idea of freedom of speech, and particularly the idea of allowing opposing views and to discuss them and to debate them, even though he may be wrong, as a means of reaching the truth. However, there's another aspect, and liberalism has been associated so much not, with freedom, not only with freedom of speech, but doing your own thing, being free to do your own thing. As Mill said, as long as you don't infringe the liberties of other people, or harm them. But there's another aspect, because the trouble of this is, is it can lead to the fragmentation of society into a whole mass of individuals who take no notice of anyone else. And there's another book which came out in 1994, which has tried to address this by David Selborne, called The Principles of Duty. And that began to identify liberalism as actually being modern liberalism after Mill, as being a corrupted liberal order. And what he was concerned about, it so emphasized the idea of of rights as opposed to responsibility. Everyone had a right, but no one seemed to have any responsibility or duty towards society. And he um, identified this through a lot of um, historical context. You mentioned Locke and others and Aristotle. Uh, But he saw this as very important, that it was the other side of rights and liberties, that you needed a duty, a civic duty, to keep the civic order going. And I just leave you with the idea that you may be cynical about the big society and say it's to do with that you can't understand what it is and it's to do with saving money. But supposing it's actually, or could be, to do with addressing this problem of some sort of relationship, duty between one citizen and another. And from that point of view, it could have great benefit. I live in New York, and it seems to me that um, now there's some new proposals that they're going to try and ban people from drinking sugary drinks who are on welfare, and they're going to try and stop smoking in public parks, uh, all on the basis that these are liberals doing good for others, and that, you know, people are stupid and don't know what they should do. And similarly, the discussion about the prevention of the Kolboda Center, what's called the the Ground Center Mosque. And liberals argued for uh, uh, it to be there, not on the basis of freedom per se, but because they had particular kind of values around cultural harmony and moderation and diversity. 
which begs the question, what if it's not? Surely we should be tolerant, but not respectful, and we should demand there should be complete freedom. Um, a, a question for Frank. I'm interested in um, how far or, or whether you would take um, this vision of moral autonomy, not just to individuals, but to groups of individuals. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that you would extend it to, say, private associations, private clubs, affinity groups. Would you also extend it to, say, commercial endeavors? I mean, they're, they're private in the sense of being non-governmental, so you might extend to them, you should extend to them, I think, some freedom from the state. But, you know, as you may know, in the states, we're having a big debate about corporate personhood, specifically around campaign finance reform, but not exclusively around campaign finance reform. So I'd really be interested in hearing your views on that. And if I can just make one quick comment about this line drawing business. It, you know, it's challenging, but it's not impossible. The reason that the Hitman manual, for example, falls, I think, on the free speech side of the line is that the harm of it is speculative. Someone may or may not read it and may or may not become a hitman because he read it, it, may have become a hitman anyway. That, that was the and problem, they did. And that's, and that's very different from uh, you know, me saying to the person next to me who is in some way under my control, go beat up that guy. The harm of that is not speculative, and that's why the, the standard that we have in the states around these issues is that speech can be regulated or prohibited when, when it is an intentional, immediate incitement to violence that is likely to succeed immediately. The reason why the Hitman case was an issue was there were murders committed using that as a manual. That's why it became an issue. It's a retrospective issue, so it's more complicated. Um, the point I want to make is about classical liberalism. Yeah. Um, I don't think Frank's position is remotely near classical liberalism, as I understand it as a philosopher. It, I mean, just to take a further example from Mill, Mill thought that um, certain acts which you might perform in your bedroom with the curtains closed were perfectly acceptable because they don't harm anyone, but he seemed to inconsistently believe that um, if you perform them in a public place, they could justifiably be censored and prevented. I mean, Mill was all about line drawing. I mean, it's, it's very odd to think that he wasn't. His, his notion of flourishing involved drawing lines. And I, I mentioned at the beginning, drew the line between societies. It wasn't meant to be a theory for so-called uncivilized societies. It's only a civilized society that could allow this degree of toleration. Pay for the consequences of your actions argument that the gentleman three rows back here raised. It, look, obviously I've got some sympathy for that, and I don't want to widen this too much out into economics, but there are difficulties here if you are providing a public <coughs> health service. Uh, I mean, I smoke cigarettes. I by and large pay substantial tax on those cigarettes. Certainly uh, the overall tax take on cigarettes uh, easily covers the overall cost of smoking-related diseases. I'm also uh, much likely to die younger than you non-smokers, so my burden on the state pension system is likely to be less in virtue of the, my consumption of tobacco. I don't, however, ever go mountaineering. I think anyone who does is a bit odd. We're not banned from doing it. I think they're rather strange. I mean, why you would want to go right the way up a hill or a mountain because it is there, which is the usual excuse, it's a rather strange thing to do. So it's not obvious to me why I should pay any taxes at all to mountain rescue. Are we actually going to <coughs> levy a tax on grappling hooks and hiking boots in order to cover those sort of costs? And I think you run into these problems fast when you actually have a publicly provided rather than personalised healthcare. I, th I think that, uh, in I don't know what classical liberalism is because it's, it's a <coughs> contested concept, but I do know one thing, which is that since Locke, uh, the idea of freedom and tolerance has more and more expanded. And you know, Locke begins with uh, tolerating belief, but is, is not interested in action or you know, what people actually do. Mill, on the other hand, you know, is, is very concerned about uh, what he calls social tolerance, which is protecting the minority from the wrath of the majority. And since that time, uh, a lot of freedoms have expanded, not, not, not simply in the domain of belief, but to actions. So for example, we now no longer uh, criminalize homosexuals for their behavior. Right? In, in other words, you know, we now uh, assume that certain forms of, of actions in public that would have been prohibited previously, uh, in a civilized society, you would give freedoms to. In other words, you would remove the state from uh, intervening in, in those kinds of activities. And I think in that sense, liberalism you know, has got this potential to expand the meaning of freedom rather than to uh, sort of try to police it. And that's why I think it's not 
stupid to re, uh, in a sense, to kind of reconstruct liberalism, because there's one thing that is a problem uh, that liberal was faced with in the past, and we, we face with today, and that's the problem of the state, which is that so much of our everyday experience is dominated by the state that unless we minimize that, you know, our our, our, our culture and our, and our future, to some extent, is, is continually compromised by us. I think that's a compelling argument for being a liberal today. One, one of the reasons that I voted Lib Dem in the last election is it seemed to me that they were actually going to take away some of that proliferation of legislation that had accrued over any government that is in power really for too long, two terms maximum, that's it, otherwise it becomes to be crap. I don't think there's any uh, necessary disjunction or choice to be made between liberalism on one hand and social responsibility on the other. And in fact, if anything, I guess if I had to call myself within a bracket, I would be a social justice liberal, which means, of course, that one's going to engage in the um, public sphere in some way. Um, I think that's enough. Okay. Hi, uh, two points. One, quickly going back to something uh, you said much earlier, which was um, when people are all colluding to commit a crime. The thing that's criminal there is the, the collusion and the intention to act rather than the production of the documents themselves, and that's what you should distinguish, I think. Um, on a broader point, and moving away from the free speech thing, I think the point about liberalism is it should be sort of historically specific. The mo what's important is what's going on at the moment and how you engage with it then. And so, yeah, classical liberalism, your, your explanations of where there are problems with this and where it, didn't, where it sort of doesn't allow rights to people, yeah, it didn't then, but it was a progressive movement at the time. And now we have to take the elements of that which are still progressive now and synthesize them into something new. And surely that's what liberalism should be uh, today and not kind of hark harping back to history. Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiments uh, argued that um, if you got a gun and went out intending to shoot somebody, and you got behind them, and then you changed your mind at the last minute, uh, you committed no crime, even though you intended to, uh, to shoot them. Um, you, you had, so you hadn't break, broken the law. Um, recently, someone was sacked for saying, I hate my boss, I want to kill him. Um, but I, 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 I believe that he was sacked not because he intended to kill his boss, but because it was a, um, it probably hurt someone's feelings. I'm wondering, especially with Nigel, uh, does he think that the support for the moral autonomous individual has changed? I think about this particularly with reference to the family, because if you just look at the history of the family, Victorian period, very anxious about state intervention into the family because they recognised it as an autonomous unit. Post-war, uh, Britain and America, more professional intervention, but with always the autonomous family as a backdrop or a buffer to that you look at all the early intervention literature now, there is absolutely no mention at all of the autonomous individual or the family as an autonomous unit. I was quite intrigued by the debate on uh, limits because I do find the discussion on limits takes on different forms wherever, you know, depending on where you come from. So I was quite surprised to hear, coming from Germany, that you want to ban fake advertising in relation to cancer medicine because it's not banned in Germany. In fact, we have it all the time. We have uh, homeopathy, we have all sorts of quangos advertising in, in very respectable newspapers and it's embraced by the German government because, and it's even paid for in part by German insurance. So nobody would actually even think of setting up a limit. Uh, equally, I was surprised to hear that there was uh, a debate about the film Jutsus in Britain, saying it should be banned on the ground that people might become Nazis. Actually, in Germany, it was considered to be a, quite an educational film, and you know, people, uh, people said, well, everybody should, should watch this film. That does show that these debates are political, cultural, and nothing to do with you know, limits which need to be absolute. Um, I, don't, I don't want to be very unpopular and, and bring this debate back to the... Um to the free speech idea, but I, I did want to point out to some of the, some of the panel who are particularly interested in, in drawing lines in free speech, but actually the, uh, the recipe for crack cocaine is actually on Wikipedia, and I don't think that since uh, the recipe for crack cocaine has been available freely on Wikipedia, and I think, I know I've looked at, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I know that, uh, I'm sure lots of people who have no interest in making crack cocaine have looked at the Wikipedia, but I don't think that since it's been there, there's been a rise in crack cocaine use.
Two brief points. Firstly, um, somebody once said that liberty is a great horse, but it needs to be ridden somewhere. Isn't liberalism in danger of being quite an arid and empty politics today? I think that needs addressing. Uh, secondly, just on Mill, if you dig into Mill uh, and you look at what he discusses with harm, he says that harm is really only harm when it's damaged to our interests as progressive beings. And that idea of progress is tied up at the heart of on liberty. And I think, again, that needs to be addressed. I was just wondering how you deal with the power issue in... Um you know, this, this point about people being seen as vulnerable and in need of support and it um, actually that relating to an idea about people not being able to exercise moral autonomy. I mean, to me that would be more about people perhaps being seen as disempowered um, and in need of support to sort of, uh, you know, uh, speak out or whatever. And so the kind of classic sort of group situation where you have a liberal forum and it's kind of assumed that everybody's got an equal chance to speak but of course that isn't the case because some people you know feel more of a sense of authority and whatever whatever else and so then you might have an idea about needing to engage with issues of power and inequality in order to somehow sort of achieve a kind of better democratic outcome um, and I was interested what Fra in, um, Frank's views about that in particular. Uh, well to the two points at the back, the gentleman who's put up his recipe for hard drugs on the internet and, um, the, and, and the chap behind him who was saying about intention to act. I don't think we have resolved this issue. I know we've focused a lot on free speech issues. I hope that the intention of the author is considered wholly irrelevant. I can't believe that that can be in any way designed as when you limit the freedom of speech. I mean, I, I might paint some abstract painting which is intended to recruit vast numbers of people to go out and become Islamic terrorists or paedophiles or something else. But if it clearly doesn't have that effect, I don't think it should be banned because of the, of the intention in my warped mind. So I just don't think we've yet resolved that one. The final point I really wanted to leave you on, which hasn't come up yet, is I think the battle of ideas, uh, small b, small i, is, is very important in promoting uh, liberalism. Uh, but I'm, I'm minded, and this is, I hope, going to be an optimistic note, albeit a cynical one, of Richard Nixon's, uh, uh, Richard Nixon's dictum that most uh, big political changes and decisions are governed by the forces of fear and hatred. Uh, and I think he's probably right in that regard. That's not a very optimistic note, but he's probably right in that regard. And I wonder why, in a society in which there is increased scepticism, um, probably verging on hostility to authority. Politicians are held in immensely lower esteem now than they were 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, as are other elements of authority. Why it is that liberals have not been able to yet marshal that scepticism and hostility about authority and the state into a more successful movement for individual freedom. And strategically, if we can crack that, we might be on our way. Well, I was actually going to just respond to that because it made me think that, you know, we, we do spend an awful lot of our time saying, listing all the things that are wrong. But I, you know, again, as a historian, I think we've lived in these last, um, for the Western world, in these last 40, 50 years, we've had better lives, freer lives, more lives in which we can achieve more of our individual potential and our, express our autonomy than has ever been there in the history of the world. Well, with a few you know, caveats for aristocrats here and there before. So I, I wouldn't want to give that away. And, and although I have a lot of problems with the, the way in which the state has extended itself into our private lives, and I don't like that, and has become a nanny state and so on and so forth, I think, you know, the good intentions of the state without being ironical about that. I mean, in the sense of actually bringing a, a, a greater level of the popu greater number of the population into some of the goods that we all uh, want is a good thing and should actually be celebrated. So I, I don't want to be, you know, complete. One where I think we are now, and I just signal this because I think it's something you should all speak out about and be wary of, where I think we're in the danger of making a huge mistake is that in response to the Brown report on higher education, we're actually giving away one of our most important centers of, of, of cultural good, public good, the universities, and actually putting them into a private sphere where they will gradually either diminish or a few of them will be left to be open to the very few. This has nothing to do with student fees. This has actually got to do with our 
our, our, the public's support for the universities, which I think on the whole are not a bad thing. I consider myself a liberal, but there is a big problem for liberals today. Look, historically, the notion of autonomy on which liberals, liberalism is based seem to imply that we as agents have a, a narrative of our intentions and choices which determines our actions. Historically, Marxists have challenged that and made us play things of alien forces, though Marxists themselves seem to be immune to ideology for some reason. But the big challenge today is actually coming from neuroscience, uh, showing the degree to which the things that we think are the choices that we make follow on from starting to, f to make the actions neurologically, that we actually begin to make the actions and then tell ourselves a story afterwards. So if there isn't that kind of genuine choice at the heart of being a human being, there's, there's no hope for a consistent liberalism. I think that uh, the question that was raised about the difference between freedom and exercising freedom is a very important one. But I think what's important to realize is that the freedom of speech does not guarantee your right to be able to exercise that because all, all, all kinds of other things intervene. Yeah. Obviously, we've got a lot of money. You have more freedom of speech than if you haven't got any money. And if you're, if you're politically confident, then you have more freedom of speech than if you're fragile and, and feel powerless. I think it's important not to confuse freedom-related issues with equality-related issues, because then we fall into the trap of getting into the freedom-equality trade-off, which is very similar to the freedom-security trade-off, where, where, where we think that if we take away a little bit of her freedom, then somehow his freedom will be greater, which, has, which is one of the uh, cultural underpinnings of what's called political correctness. That if you, you know, censor or you, you kind of have reverse discrimination, then that's going to make somebody more powerful. But invariably, it really doesn't. I think it's a very important question was raised by Wendy in the back, which is about what I call the problem of juridification, which is this, which is I think that one of the problems that we have is that the private sphere and private sphere related activities has expanded to other organizations. So although in this country we don't have corporate personhood yet, what we do have is a very powerful uh, imperative towards bringing in legal instruments towards the regulation of the affairs of companies but also of NGOs and, and charities. And I think we have to take a very clear line on this. You know, if, for example, a Catholic organization doesn't want to uh, have its people uh, uh, kind of encourage the adoption of children by homosexuals, I disagree with that. But they have the freedom to act in accordance with their beliefs as much as anybody else who has the opposite point of view. And similarly, I don't think that companies uh, should be forced to sign up to uh, corporate responsibility statements, ethical response, all the rest of that. I don't think that informal relations between organizations ought to be subject to legal instruments in the way that is the case at the moment. Uh, I think that that's, a, a, that's quite important for the very simple reason that the next institution that is going to be juridified will be the family. And that's the inexorable logic, and I think that's something that we need to take into account and, and have a very robust uh, sort of liberal approach uh, uh, kind of answer to that. Thank you. Thank you.